Well, thanks a lot, Sonny and the youth. I got to follow this. Good grief. Okay, if you take your Bibles and turn to Galatians chapter 6. Galatians chapter 6. And, and folks, my heart's heavy right now for our church um, with all the stuff going on. So this is a message that uh, may sting a few people. But it's a message that the Lord laid on my heart to, to, uh, to give to his body and his church. It's his words. And Paul is talking to the church in Galatia. And he's talking about when one member of the body is injured and in sin, it's up to the rest of the body to come around and help them get up, not to put their foot on them, but to give the hand down to reach them back up. And so today the title of this message is Healing a Broken Body, Healing a Broken Body. And it's Galatians chapter 6 verses 1 through 5 is what we're going to look at today. You know, our bodies are amazing. Many of you got more new parts on your body these days than you do your car. You've had hip replacements, knee replacements, eye replacements, hand replacements. You got rods. I know my brother back in the back got more metal in the back of his back than half my car does. It's all made of plastic. He's had so many back surgeries and stuff. Many of you have gone through different cult surgeries. Verna's probably getting ready to go through one now. You may be getting ready to go through. Marie just went through and got did a miracle work in her life and so we praise him for these things but our bodies are you know as I said right now I'm dealing with a, a cracked rib and it's, it's, it bothers my whole body it bothers my mind you ever had migraines if you suffer with migraines you know it just shuts you down um, arthritis who's my arthritis friends out here all right yeah we got a good fan club growing when that old weather drops like it's gonna be 29 tonight I can tell you, I'm, I'm better than the weatherman. I can tell you what's going to happen. I'm more accurate than the weatherman. And we all know that. We start feeling the pain in our legs. We know it's coming. So we just got to hunker down. One of these days, these bodies are going to be healed, and we're never going to have to feel another pain again. We're never going to see another doctor. We're not going to have that big old pill counter <laughs> on the counter that's got all the, it looks like Skittles. It's got so many pills in it. Those things are going to be gone. But when we have a problem in our body, the rest of the body suffers. And have you ever gotten like an eyelash in your eye and it just irritates you? Just a, a stinking little eyelash bothers the, the fire out of you. Well, that's the way it is in the body of Christ. It's no different. The Bible tells us that every saved individual is a part of the body of Christ. It says in 1 Corinthians 12, 12 through 14 this. It says, for as the body is um, one of many parts, and all the parts of that body, though many, are one body, so also in Christ. For we were baptized by one spirit, bind us together, we keep singing, bind us together. We were baptized with one spirit into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, we were all made to drink of the one spirit. So what Paul has says, he says, while a problem in your life and my life might not affect the, the global church, it sure affects the local church when we got a problem in our life that's not being dealt with. Because it quenches the spirit, it causes disunity, and it's got to be handled immediately. Or it's going to cause infester, infester. So my duty today is to share with you in love how to heal a broken body. Let's stand as we read Galatians chapter 6. We're going to read the first verse. We're going to work down the others, but we're going to read the first verse only today. Brethren... If anyone is caught in any trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness, each one looking to yourself so that you too will not be tempted. Let's pray. Father God, thank you for your word this morning. I pray for you, the power of it. I pray that I'd get away from this and that you'd bring your Holy Spirit in here just to convict and to root out anybody that's causing problems. It's in your name I pray, Jesus. Amen. I hope you brought the Holy Spirit with you this morning to worship and not the devil. Because <laughs> there's some that have been doing that, and enough is enough, folks. Enough is enough. We're not doing this anymore. Paul's telling us how to go about the process of setting things right in the body of Christ. And the very first word inside of our passage here is brethren. Brothers is what he's saying. He's speaking to the church, and he's saying, church, you need to listen to me. He says... If anyone is caught in any trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a person. And here's the key to it. 
With harshness? No. With a spirit of gentleness. You go to them and you say, you're out of line. And I love you enough to tell you that. You're hurting the body. And the body's tired of it. So we're not going to put up with this anymore. So you and me are going to spend time together till you get right. And when you get right, then we're going to be good. And then the church will be able to move on. But until you show some repentance, until you show some remorse, we can't move forward. Amen. And you know what? 99% of these people, when somebody messes up, 99% of the people in this church, if they come remorseful and repentive, you're the first to jump up and go hug them and say, love you. Don't worry about it. Keep going. Go and sin no more like Jesus said. You know, we've all messed up. Some of us bigger mess ups <laughs> than others, but we've all messed up. So we ought to have that spirit of knowing that, you know, it could be us the next time. So when somebody's hurting, somebody's fallen and, and trespassed, that we ought to go to them with gentleness and say, hey, brother, sister, I'm here for you. I'm not here to condemn you. I'm not here to condone your sin, but I'm here to try and help. How do I help you get back on your feet? How do I pray for you? How do, you know, how, what can I do as your brother and sister to help get you restored in fellowship with the Lord? Because you're out of fellowship right now. And I know that you don't want to be there. I know you want to be back with the Lord. So Paul uses that word brother, as I said, and he talks about in the first verse that the body is injured. He says, if anyone is caught, and that idea of caught, it means a false step, and it refers to a transgression that of the limitations. God has placed boundaries in our life, and he says, these are things that you can't do, and these are things that you can do. I put a boundary around you. I've given you laws. I've given you grace. I've given you mercy, and I've told you that you need to operate out of the fruit of the Spirit. And as long as you do that, we're good. But when you switch over, and start doing the deeds of the flesh is what it's called in Galatians 5, 19 through 21. Those are all the things that you're either operating in the flesh or the spirit, Paul says. He says, verses 19 of chapter 5 through 21, he says, that's what the flesh does. Then he goes to um, verses 22 through 26, and he says, that's what the spirit looks like. So you look at that laundry list and you check off, is, am I doing this? Am I doing this? Am I doing this? Then I'm operating in the spirit. If I'm doing this other stuff, then I'm operating the flesh, and I need to get right. I need to get on my face before the Lord and humble myself. But it talks this word caught means to stumble. It's a picture of a believer who stumbles or makes a false step in his or her walk with the Lord. Again, God has put up boundaries for us, and he says, these aren't to hurt you. These are to keep you in a good place with me. There's nothing better than walking with the Lord, knowing that your heart's pure at the moment, that you have unconfessed sin that's been taken care of, that your personal relationship with him is very strong. There's nothing better than that. Your socks get to go up and down all day long. And if you don't have socks, maybe your skin on your legs is going to go up and down, back and forth. But this situation is far too common in the church. We're aware, aware of the boundaries that God set our problem is that we choose to step over those boundaries. And, and here's the deal. It's a personal choice that you make. Just like it's a personal choice that you make to follow God. And what happens is it just starts gradually. Just a little something. And then a little bit more. And then a little bit more. And then next thing you know, you're going, why, how did I get this far away from the Lord? How in the world did I get this far? It didn't happen overnight. But let me tell you the beautiful thing about it. You can get back to the Lord like that by simply confessing to him. This is what James says in James chapter 1, verses 13 through 16. No one undergoing a trial should say, I'm being tempted by God. For God is not tempted by evil, and he himself doesn't tempt anyone. But each person is tempted when he is drawn away and enticed by his own evil desires. Then after desires are conceived, it gives birth to sin. And when sin is fully grown, it gives birth to death. James says at the end, don't be deceived, my dear brothers. Don't be deceived by the things of the world. The next word it talks about in this passage is trespass. Brethren, if anyone is caught in any trespass, that's a sin, that's a wrongdoing, that's a transgression. 
And it's the ideal of being overtaken by surprise before you can make your escape. The sin is exposed, and you're right out in the middle. You didn't have time to get away. It's the ideal of a criminal being caught red-handed in the commission of a crime. And for the believer, the picture is of a word of the believer who finds himself in a situation that got completely out of hand. I never meant for it to go this far. I just was kind of playing around with that sin, and I never expected it to grow this much. The thing about sin is sin starts small, but it never stays small. It continues to grow and grow in your life. And the longer you don't deal with it, the more it happens. It's always a progressive thing. It's like an awful cancer that grows into your body till it consumes your life if you don't deal with it. And when there's cancer of sin in the life of a believer, guess who starts getting excited about that? Oh, Satan himself. And guess what he's going to do? He's going to pour on the heat. He'll not rest till he exposes that Christian to the world so that the cause of Christ is harmed and the testimony of that believer. So that word trespass also has two elements to it. There's, there's always a surprise that they were caught. Many people believe that they're too smart and too crafty. They're never going to get caught in their sin. It happens. It happens. Even if we don't find out about it or others don't find out about it, the most important person finds out about it, and that's God. It says in Hebrews 4.13, No creature is hidden from him, but all things are naked and exposed to the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. You are not doing anything in secret. You are not thinking anything in secret. It's all exposed to God. And you know what he says on that judgment day? He says, I'm going to hold you account for every thought, deed, and action that you did, whether good or bad in the body. And guess what? It's not going to be a a judgment where he says, okay, Counts First Baptist, come on in. Everybody from Counts First Baptist, y'all just stack up here. We're going to judge you as one. No, no, ma'am, no, sir. He's going to pull Jimmy down there, and he's going to say, Jimmy, I need to talk to you. It's an individual judgment. Now, being a teacher, being a pastor, I am going to be held to a higher judgment because I'm responsible for you. I'm responsible for tending the sheep, for teaching the word, and not being a false teacher. For living a life that models Christ. You Sunday school teachers, you're going to be held to a higher judgment. So you take that very, very serious as you teach the word. You know, um, so God's going to see those things. The second is there a surprise at the condition. No one wakes up in the morning and says, I just want to destroy my whole life. I want to destroy my family. I want to destroy my church. Nobody does that. But that's what sin does. It slowly starts out and it leads to things and it continues this downward progression and produces these circumstances. The next word in our passage is restore. Brethren, if anyone is caught in any trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness. The ideal restore is to set a broken or dislocated bone. And what he's saying here, he says, when a Christian falls into sin, it creates a problem for the whole body. The whole body suffers when a Christian does this. Sin in the body is like an injury that hinders the physical body. If you remember the story in Joshua 7 of Achan, Achan decided that when they went to Ai, or when they went to a battle, God told them, don't touch any of the goods. You don't take anything with you. You just wipe them out, and I guarantee the victory. Well, Achan decided to take some things, and he buried him under his tent because he was greedy. He knew what God wanted him to do, yet he decided he was going to do what he wanted to do. And because of that, he thought his sin was in private. I got away with it. Nobody's going to know. Well, guess what happened? His sin brought defeat, death to the nation of Israel. There were major repercussions. What he thought was private 
got exposed. And he still does the same thing today. When a believer gets out of step with the Lord and falls into sin, they may feel like it's a private business. It, it's, their sin doesn't hinder. It's my life. Don't worry about it. It doesn't bother you. I've heard that with so many spouses as they get into counseling. They say that spouse has a problem with them, with something that they're doing, their anger or whatever, or addiction. And he, the person will say, it's my life. It's not bothering you. Well, yes, it is. It affects the, the home family. And then it affects the church family. Then it affects the kingdom family. It's a ripple effect. It always affects. Sin hinders the work of God. Unconfessed and unforgiven sin blows out the Holy Spirit in a church. Can't work. Can't work. It's not free to work. So what do we do? Do we just continue on doing the same thing over and over, expecting to see God do revival? Or do we rend our hearts and cleanse them? And say, God, we keep talking about seeing these revivals all over. There's a reason you're not sending it here. So start with me. That's what we talked about Wednesday night about judging others. That we're all quick to do that. We all do it. We're all guilty of it. But the Bible says that we're to judge ourselves first. And that's what this passage even talks about. Examine yourself first and quit worrying. I've got enough trash in my own life I've got to deal with. I don't need to worry about your stuff. I don't have time to talk about you. I got enough stuff I deal with on a daily basis with Jimmy because Jimmy messes up every day. I, I'm sorry that I burst your bubble that you think <laughs> this is Adrian Rogers up here, but it's far from it, folks. I'm a sinner saved by grace that fights that battle of the flesh every day just like you. And so I know how you battle because I battle the same thing. Every day I work on trying to make my walk better with the Lord. So, some of y'all have had an appendectomy. Some of you have known people that have an appendectomy. The appendix is a very small organ. But when that thing ruptures, if it ruptures, it can poison the whole body. There can be a little small portion, a little small group that wants to rupture the body and poison the whole thing. And just like an appendectomy is a very painful but necessary procedure that has to be done so is dealing with problems inside the body. The church, the sin in the church has got to be handled the same way. If the body is to heal and function as it should be. What's the best way to handle sin? His way. And what does he say? Confess it. Repent. What was John the Baptist's message all the time? Repent, you brood vipers. <laughs> He was yelling at the religious people, wasn't he? That's the one that thought they had all their life together. And, and John the Baptist was harsh on him. And he says, you're the problem. You're putting stuff on people that God never intended. Quit teaching them your stuff and teach them God's stuff. So when sin is confessed, and that's what he wants us to do, because Proverbs 28, 13 says, He who conceals his transgressions will not prosper, but he who confesses and forsakes them will find compassion. So here's three things that happen when sin is confessed. And this is very important because if you aren't confessing your sin regularly, it's going to build up and build up and you're not going to deal with it. And you're quenching the spirit. Number one, it puts the believer back into the right fellowship with the Lord. Doesn't, you don't lose your salvation, but the minute you have unconfessed sin on your heart and you hadn't dealt with it, God says, we're going to have to have a time out, son. Jimmy, I'm going to put a little conviction around you. <laughs> I'm going to send people up to you that kind of tap you on the shoulder and say, what's going on with you, man? I'm going to, I'm going to turn up the heat a little bit because I love you enough to discipline you. 1 John 1, 9 says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So what dad up there is saying, he going, just come to me. You're my child. Let's talk. Take this off you. Give it to me. I died on the cross for that sin. Let's get rid of it. The second thing, it begins the process of healing in the body of Christ. Until... A member shows remorse and sorrow 
over their sin. The body can't help. But the minute they do, the body comes flying up to them and aid. The members of the body come and they aid that injured person. They feel that they're not alone anymore. The third thing sin does is it shuts up the gossips because they don't have any more ammunition. You dealt with that. The Lord says that a gossiper is just as guilty as the guy that's in sin. If you rejoice over somebody's falling, you got a problem. You got a heart problem. You need to get right with the Lord on that. Because as Christians, we should have compassion. Look at the mercy and grace God has given us. My goodness, can we not give some of that back? Folks, if we want our church to get there, we're going to have to be people of love, people of forgiveness. Proverbs 26, 20. I love this. I had a fire last night. Can I have another one tonight? Allison's so happy about that. But Proverbs 26, 20 says, For lack of wood, the fire goes out. Where there is no whispering, quarrel ceases. So if we want to stop that stuff, we got to put the fire out. we got to quit adding fuel. The problem is if we don't bring our sin to light and we attempt to hide it, God will bring it up. You know, you ever taken a ball when you're in the swimming pool and held it down? Eventually that ball is going to pop up. Sometimes it'll hit you in the face. Well, that's what happens when we try and bury our sin. God's eventually going to pull our hands off and it's going to snap up in the air. It's going to be exposed if you don't deal with it in a timely manner. The second thing is the body involved. Look at verse 2. It says, bear one another's burdens, thereby fulfill the law of Christ. So, the injured body, the body responds to that injury. That's, it's always going to do that. Whenever you get a migraine, the, the body's going to say, you need to close your eyes. You need to get in a dark room. When you got the arthritis, the body's going to say, you need to get the heating pad. You need to get the ibuprofen. You need to do whatever you need to do to do that. The body's going to respond and try and tell the other parts, okay, we need to help this, okay? We need, to, we need to take care of this because something's wrong. You hurt your leg, your right leg, and you start putting more weight on your left leg. Pretty soon the left leg hurts worse than the right leg because you overcompensated for it. Romans 12, 15 says, rejoice with those who rejoice, weep with those who weep. 1 Corinthians 12, 26 says, if any one member suffers, all the members suffer with it. If one member is honored, all the members rejoice with it. So as a church body, what we do, when somebody we know is in the ditch, when somebody we know is hurting, we hurt with them. We're like Job's friends the first couple of days, not the last. <laughs> we go up to them, we might not even have to say words. But we just sit with them and we say, I know you're hurting. I just want to give you a hug. I know you probably don't want to talk about it, but I want you to know I'm here. May even take them some cookies. May even take them some food. If you're a real Christian, you'll take them some brisket. It's the way we respond to an injury in the body that is the focus of Paul's writing here. And what he's telling us exactly is how the body is to respond to an injured member. This assumes that this member has made uh, the attempt and fulfillment of getting right first with God, confessing their sin and saying, okay, I know I messed up, but I'm ready, I'm ready to put this behind me. And the church body comes around and says, we got you. The next thing it says in the second part of verse 1, it says, you who are spiritual. Now, that's a, we don't like to think that we're righteous. We don't like to think what we're spiritual. But the idea of being spiritual is living and showing the fruit of the Spirit in their lives. That's what it is, living under the control of the Holy Spirit. He's saying those that are spiritual, not the troublemakers, not the ones running their mouth. He says, you who are spiritual, it's time for you to rise up. When you see trouble, you who are spiritual are the first responders. You're the ones that need to go there and help that person. It doesn't mean that you're perfect, but it means that you are exhibiting the fruit of the Spirit. And this is the fruit of the Spirit. It's right there, probably on the same page that you're looking at, Galatians 5, through 23. It says, but the fruit of the Spirit is love. Check these things off. Are these evident in your life? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. And then you got the deeds of the flesh, which are evident, it says, starting in verse 19. Immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, 
jealousy, outburst of anger, disputes, dissension, factions, envying, drunkenness, carousing, these things of which I forewarned you just as I've forewarned those who practice these things. So Paul says, you're either working in the flesh or you're working in the spirit. And God wants you to work in the flesh. And if you're those who are spiritual, what he's talking about, those are the ones that are operating in the flesh. And Paul's not referring to some gossiping busybody who's just throwing around. That person is a cardinal Christian. You may be saved, but that person is a cardinal Christian and they need to get right with the Lord. So the rest of this section is for those who are called spiritual believers and possess the fruit of the Spirit that we just talked about. There's a command. It says, in a spirit of gentleness, restore. The ideal restore is to strengthen worn down people. To mix medicines to produce healing balm. You know what our medicines are? They're prayer, they're scripture, they're the fruit of the Spirit. You mix all those together and you get to work. It's the ideal to put things in order. It's the ideal to be a peacemaker, not a troublemaker. The ideal that the spiritual believer will help the fallen believer be restored to the place they once were in Christ. Some of people have had to have a bone broken to have it reset where it needed to be. That's a painful experience, but it's short pain for a long-lasting lifetime to bypass problems. So it is with the church. For some people, it's hard to forgive sins of others and forget the past, but we are called to do that. You were commissioned to do that. And Jesus says, if you don't forgive them, I won't forgive you. That settles it for us right there, folks. There shouldn't be any question about offering forgiveness when you hear that. I'm going to hold it back, so God's going to hold mine back? No. No. You're not going to get that. <laughs> you have a lot of things from me, but you're not going to get my forgiveness taken away. I'm keeping that because I've got to use it daily. There's a challenge again, though. When you're helping someone that's in a mess, do it with gentleness. One of the worst things you can do is go jam your finger in their face and say, I know what you're doing, and it's wrong. Or another thing that you can do is run around telling everybody, I can't believe this person's doing this and this and this. We're flapping your chops. That does no good. That's not operating in the spirit. None of us are in a position to gloat. You know why? Because the next time it could be you. And that always happens. The world calls it karma. The Bible calls it reaping and sowing. And what I found is people that stir up trouble, next thing you know, their, tr their life's in trouble. And all the joy that they had taking advantage of somebody else's misery, now their life is misery. Reap what you sow. You sow good stuff, you're going to reap good stuff. I would never want this to happen to you or me. But imagine the Lord allowing every thought that you've ever had played in full color and stereo up here. You'd run me out of town quick. And we'd all be embarrassed. Thank goodness he calls us to be Christ-like. Verse 2, he says, bear one another's burdens, carry one another's burdens. And it's a weight that's too heavy to be carried. It's a picture of an injured body unable to bear the load. When we're injured, the entire body's got to compensate for that weakest part. And he says, when you do this, you fulfill the law of Christ. What is the law of Christ? It's Jesus reproducing his life through his spiritual body in the world, meaning his church. You'll never be more like Jesus when you actively seek to restore a relationship that's been broken or a fallen person that's in sin. You'll never be more like Jesus. I want to talk to you a minute about how my clock up here says 10 o'clock. I got another, I got plenty of time. I, I, thought, I thought I was about to run out of town, but I, it's just 10 o'clock. I want to talk about how Jesus confronted sinners because this is very important and how we should treat the fallen. Let's talk about John chapter 4, the woman at the well. The disciples go in town to get some flies. Um, they're, they're traveling through Samaria, which J Jews typically didn't go through Samaria because they had race issues. They thought that the Samarians were nasty and despicable people and not worthy of anything. And so Jesus is hanging out by this well, 
Jacob's well, by the way. And this Samaritan woman comes up. And he says, hey, babe, how about a drink of water? And she says, why would you ask me? Jews don't associate with me. And he says, if you knew the water that I could give you, you would never thirst again. And then he says, by the way, do me a favor. Go back home and get your husband. See, he's loving on her at first, but he's not glossing over her sins. And he says, go get your husband. And she says, uh, I don't have a husband. And he says, yeah, that's right. Um, you've had five, by the fact, and the one you're living with right now isn't your husband. He convicts her of her sin. She says, you must be a prophet. He says, oh, I'm much more than that. He loves on her. She ends up going back to the village and shares about Christ because her sin was confronted. She repented of it, and she went back home with a new heart. That's the way you do it. Let's talk about the woman in caught in adultery, John chapter 8. Jesus is walking up into the temple square to teach. The Pharisees are there, and they come dragging this woman in, probably naked, and they throw her down in front of Jesus because they want to trick Jesus. And they said, the law says that when a woman's caught in adultery, you stone her. Oh, Jesus, you know what he does? Where's the man, number one? Where's the dude she was caught with? Why don't they bring him? They didn't bring him. It's brought her. Jesus bends down in the ground. You remember what he does? He starts writing. I don't know if he's writing scripture. I don't know if he's writing names of the people around there saying, this is your sin. You slept with her. All this stuff. I don't know what he was writing, but obviously it got their attention. Because the finger of God was writing in that sand. And they say, teacher, what, you know, the law says that we're to stone a person that does this. What do you say? You remember what he said? He says, he who is without sin cast the first stone. They were instantly convicted. One by one, they start dropping their rocks, and they leave. And he's left there with this poor woman. He loves on her. He doesn't gloss over her sin. He restores her, and she goes on, a new disciple of his. Then you got the sinner who anointed his feet in Luke chapter 7. Jesus has been invited over to a Pharisee's house, and the Pharisees are all excited because they got this guy that's, you know, high profile supposedly. And I don't know how it worked in those days. I guess it didn't have doors. But this woman just walks in with this alabaster box. And she's crying. Because she knows that this man is special. And she knows she needs forgiveness. So she kneels down at his feet. And she starts putting that expensive perfume on and cleaning his feet with her hair. The Pharisee goes nuts. And he says, do you know who this woman is? He says, I sure do. She's okay. What she's done is more worthy than the meal that you put on the table. Then we got little Zacchaeus. Luke 19. He is a rich chief tax collector. And he's a short person, they say. He hears Jesus is coming along. So he goes climbing up in the tree because he's heard about this guy that he's special. And Zacchaeus, I feel like, is under conviction because he, he wants to see who Jesus is. He wants to be around Jesus. So he gets up in the tree, and he's standing up there, and all of a sudden Jesus walks by, and he goes, Zacchaeus, come on down because I'm going to your house to eat. Now Zacchaeus knows that he's done some evil things as a tax collector. So he gets down, and the very first thing he says to Jesus is, Jesus, listen, I know that I've, I've, I've mishandled money. I've, I've stolen I'll pay back whatever I need to do. You tell me. Let's fix this. Jesus says, salvation has come to the house of Zacchaeus today. You see how Jesus deals with sinners? Is that the way we do? Brothers and sisters, we got to. Amen. That's the model. And we see 
the consistent treatment of sinners, the very first thing that he does is he it's always, Jesus is always honest with them. He never glosses over their sin. He doesn't pretend that their sins don't happen. Second, he loves them and he forgives them. Thirdly, he treated them with respect and love. He didn't look down at the woman and say, yep, you are a prostitute. He didn't look at Zacchaeus and say, yep, you're a thief. He let the Holy Spirit convict those people. And then he says, but I got a way out of this. You're going to be okay. Again, when a believer has fallen into sin, the best thing we can do for him is what? Begins with an L, love, and then forgive him. Our duty is very clear. Reach out and restore. Reconciliation. Help them out because it could be you next. Jesus said this in John 13, 15. He says, for I've given you an example that you also should do just as I've done for you. Verses 3 and 5. Let's look at those real quick. It says, For if anyone thinks he is something when he is nothing, he deceives himself. But each one must examine his own work, and then he will have reason for boasting in regard to himself alone, not in regard to other. For each one will bear his own load. Verse 6, The one who is taught with the word to share all good things with the one who teaches him. All right. Let's talk about verse 3, what it says here. Basically, what that verse says, it's the ideal of never looking down on somebody else thinking you're better than them or not the cross is level at the bottom and that's where we all are nobody is better than anybody else that's a dangerous attitude to possess scripture warns clearly of it proverbs 16 18 is a verse you know very well pride comes before destruction and an arrogant spirit before fall that is true (laughs) that verse has rung true so many times Verse 4 is about personal obedience. That every man and woman should live his own life in obedience to the Lord. And he talks about boasting. We don't boast in ourselves. That's what Paul says. We boast in what God's done through our lives. The things he saved us from and bought us out of. You're a trophy to the Lord. He holds you up and he says, this is what you used to be, but I got hold of you. And now you're like that 14-point buck hanging on the wall up in heaven. He looks down and he says, Paul used to be that way, but now look at what he did. He looks around and he he points him out. Verse 5 looks like a personal contradiction here with verse 2. Because in verse 2 he says, we're to bear each other's burdens. And then in verse 5 he says, hey, you need to carry your own. What does that mean? Well, there's some things that are so heavy that you're going to need help with. But there's other things in our life individually that we're going to have to deal with ourselves. It'll be between you and God. And you'll have to carry that. Others can try and help, but you're going to have to carry that load. Maybe a death of someone. Maybe an illness. I don't know what it is. Maybe financial, whatever. But it's going to be something that individually that you're going to have to do that. And when you do that, you give glory to God. And here's the, the ideal of it, too. At the end of when this is all said and done, the Lord is not going to ask me about Paula's sins. The Lord's going to ask Paula about her sins. We're all going to stand alone at that judgment and have to face what we do. So I'll leave you with these three things because it's just 1015. I should have just now started. Anyone who has not dealt with their sin in their life needs to do so today. Your sin should not be allowed to hinder the church another minute. Number two, anyone who has responded wrongly to the sin of another believer needs to make things right with the Lord first today. Stop the gossiping and the spreading the word about sin and get right today. You may even need to apologize. Let me tell you something, because this really got my chili hot. I don't usually do this, but I'm going to do it because I'm tired of this stuff. We have a men's prayer breakfast yesterday. We are talking about our church, praying for our church to heal. After we say amen, one gentleman walks outside 
tells another gentleman, starts gossiping about me and everything else, and this other gentleman shut him down and left. We just left a prayer meeting. He needs to repent to the Lord. He needs to repent to the person he told that trash to. He needs to repent to me. He needs to do it quick. I'm calling him out from now on. Enough is enough. No more of this. If we're going to get a church back, it's going to have to happen this way. Let's all stand. Kids, I just kind of want y'all to come back up here and sing again. (laughs) Penny, do you mind? Come on up here. I'll be down front if you need anything. Oh, we forgot the offering. Okay. Okay, we'll do it after the invitation. Let it rip. If y'all want to sit, sit. If you want to stay.